Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Product management is something that didn't come naturally to me and is something I've been working on for the last three years since I started my company. Thankfully, I'm at a point now where I recently hired a product manager to take over from my shortcomings in that aspect of running the company. Going through this process made it clear to me that we all struggle to manage this part of our business. And so I decided to invite Matt Barnett, founder of Bonjoro, to talk with me about it in this episode. I chose him because he has a background in industrial design and lots of experience managing product development for various companies, including several of his own like Bonjoro, which helps companies customize their onboarding experience for users. We spoke specifically about why should a founder focus on their product, why you should start with the problem, why you should try to consider all possible solutions before taking action, why is making mistakes an acceptable and constant part of innovation and progress, What are the three stages of feature conceptualization? If a founder wants to step back, what are the first steps they should take? What kinds of people should you hire to manage your product? And is there a logical order for hiring them? And much more. So thank you very much to Matt, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. I'm really excited to talk with you about product as a person myself who is not trained in design or product. I'm completely self-taught and working with my team. I've learned a lot. Uh, Hopefully talking with you can help me get better at it. And hopefully the audience will understand better why they should focus more on their product as founders of their companies. So welcome to the show, Matt. Great. Thanks for having me, Sean. So before we go any further, why don't we tell everyone a little bit about what it is you do now, maybe a little bit of your backstory and how you became interested in product and design. Yeah. So I run a company called Bonjour. Uh, I'm the the Papa Bear or CEO, but I also sit as um, head of product. Uh, we basically do personalized video messaging. So we're a system that works top of your CRM, shop mailing lists. And what we found is that when customers perform certain actions, such as a lead comes in or they make a purchase, if you want to improve retention and overall lifetime value, customer service, customer support is at the core of that. So what we do is we'll get you to send personalized video messages to welcome customers on board, thank them for purchasing, get them to share the, uh, the news and, uh, and talk about what it is you do, do as a company. And that's how we essentially work. Myself, I was designed by trade. So I actually trained as an industrial designer, which is, if you say product design, half engineering and half art, it kind of welds those two together. So I always assumed I would go into building tangible products, things that you can get off the shelf. Like I worked in design solvency as as my first job, did a lot of medical stuff, did a lot of like, like we worked for like Rolls Royce doing cars and and kind of front end stuff. We did mobile phones and devices. And then I moved to Australia from the UK and somehow fell into technology. But ultimately it is the same process. Both it does like building companies and building products. Like a building product is still about working with users, testing a hypothesis, pulling that back, building the first version, building a second version. You know, obviously if you own the company as well, you are raising money to like tool up. So obviously in, in products, that's in terms of like engineering capacity versus actually hard tools. Uh, but really it's the same process that you go through. May, maybe the main difference is that if you're building real world tangible products, you are more likely to build product suites. So you'll be building new products and new products and new products and the older products will be a, like ultimately ch- chucked away after a time. Whereas when you build products online and software, you tend to start to build upon the product that you started with. So you end up building this this, this monolith over time that ties everything back together. That's probably the primary difference, but the actual online offline, it's not really that different at all. Okay, so I think the most important thing we should start with is why should a founder focus on their product? There's two sides here. What I'm not going to say is it's not about build it and they will come. Like you need to go out there, market and sell your products, like regardless. So it's not like just amazing product that like helps. But when you first start building 
whatever it is you're building, you have to get product market fit. And so the market side is really important, but the product part is just as important as well. Now, if you understand how products work, if you understand how to build products, if you understand how to build products to go and solve problems and those correct problems, you're going to get more uptake. You're going to get customers staying longer. You're going to get more activation and you're going to build a business faster. So ultimately, the more the more that users use your product, even if you haven't sourced out your pricing, if you haven't sorted about other things, they will stay with you longer and talk about you longer and start to build your funnel and help you go and solve the next problem. So if you, if you build great products, the chances of your success are increased multiple fold. So let's assume that the audience has never built a product before. They are either wanting to start a company or ha- have started a company like myself, but this is the first time building a product. So talk a little bit more about what some of the things that they should be thinking about, some of the mistakes they may make if they're not thinking ahead and things like that. Yeah. So most businesses start with like, obviously the concept of an idea. And hopefully you start with a problem. If you haven't got a problem behind the idea, go back and, and work out what it really is because you need to understand the problem fundamentally. Don't start with the solution. Start with what the issue is, get to the solution and think about all the different ways you can solve it. It's one of the reasons why a lot of startups fail. It's not that they've got the problem wrong and the problem is often there, but by jumping to the solution, they've missed more obvious solutions, easier to build solutions and better solutions. So really have a look at what it is you're fixing, um, what it is you're doing. You know, with us, when we built our business, it was about connecting with customers. So how do you connect with customers on a one-to-one level, but do it in a scalable way? And that was the challenge. Ultimately ended up like video was the way to go here. And the way we built the system was the way to solve that. But that was a problem that we were trying to solve initially. So really strip back to what the fundamental mental problem is. Then when you start to look at the products, start with an open sketchbook. Solve the problem in every way you can. Whoever you've got on the team, whoever you've got around you, bring them in and get the ideas out. So really start to go quite wide before you go narrow. I think, again, you know, we all start to get blinkers. And as your, as your business builds and builds and builds momentum and gets larger and larger, those blinkers actually become narrower. So trying to think and rethink about problems and think outside the box again is always, is always something you need to consciously go and do. So look at this. And this is before you even touch. Don't touch anything to do with design. Don't touch anything else. Use a sketchboard. Use paper. You know, don't start building things before you've really thought about the problem at its core, stripped it back, and then gone wide on solutions and what you could do. Now, what you're looking for in the solutions then is what solves the core problem 80% of the, of the way with the least amount of work. Because when you first start something, what you're looking to do is, is to work out if your hypothesis is correct as quickly as possible. The other place you see people fail with early products is they go and build the perfect solution. It takes a long time. It takes a year to build. And then they get to the end and turns out it wasn't the perfect solution. It might look amazing, but but they've missed something fundamental that they didn't understand, not because they didn't think through it properly, but because users behave in ways that we don't expect. And the world changes and things happen. So you need to get things out the door quickly when you first start, because you need to work out, this is a problem. We think we can solve it with this. Is that a true hypothesis? And we talk to 10 people, I'm a mum, I'm my auntie, and they all say, yeah, it's a great idea. You put in the hands of users and then they do some completely different that you couldn't have expected because human psychology is hard to understand. So strip it back, see if you can get to what you think is an 80% solution, does not need to be 100%. If you can get something out the door as quick as possible, and this can be, use whatever you like, it can be PowerPoint, it can be Excel, it can be Figma, you don't have to code a single thing. Um, you might want to do a little bit. It's okay if you want to spend you know, a couple months or something, um, but get it out the door quickly. And then the next most important part of all of this, and this will stay with you for life, is you then have to get people using it that you don't know, and you have to talk to them and watch them. So don't do this in an isolated box. I think that that's probably like quite a good starting point. So there's a few things in there. I don't know if you want to dive in and pick some of this part or. I think that's a fantastic starting point for sure. I, I love how you mentioned having people try to sketch out all possible solutions before taking any action. Because I think what most people would do is to say, I have an idea. I think this is a solution. I'm going to go build it. And then people go, eh. And you go, oh, okay, now I need to go and build it again and see what happens. And people go, eh. And then you build it again. Kind of like an inventor, right? An inventor will say, I'm going to build this. And then it fails. But for them, it's not a failure, right? They're like, okay, well, it didn't work this way. Let me try it again. Let me try it again. Let me try it again. But had they tried to tackle it in all of those different ways, they could go, and start something 
with the guests and then figure out and tweak and then eventually all of their potential solutions together might actually make sense. And there's parts of all of the different solutions together actually make something cohesive where in the initial stages of thinking about it, they were disparate options. Yeah, like, and you're cross pollinate ideas. You're taking a little bit from this one, a little bit from this one. If you have different brains, and this is why, why it's important having a team or, or a co-founder who does not think in the same way as you. If you're a creative and they're an engineer, then you're going to have very different solutions to any problem. And the beauty of it is, is that the real solution, the unique solution is probably somewhere in the middle of those. One of the things I would say is give us the time it needs. We are all in a rush to build our businesses. You know, we're, we're a few years in, we're still in the rush. Every sprint is like, oh my God, how much can we do? But what you find is if you spend more time on the problems initially and you spend more time scoping and you spend more time researching and investigating, it actually ultimately gets you stuff out, out the door faster because it means you're not necessarily making mistakes down the line. You're finding easier ways. You're finding different ways. You're finding better solutions. So it's actually worth investing the time up front. I mean, this goes back to like university, like early studying. Having that time to research gave you great results at the end of it. Like you need to be back in that mindset where like you do not have to solve the problem today. You might want to spend two weeks researching everything around there, pulling all the ideas, looking at everything and and guarantee it's very, very rare that the first solution you come up with for any problem is is the one that, that ultimately becomes the end one. You might build it and then like you said, it doesn't really work very well. So you have to go and rebuild it anyway. You want to try and minimize that. You'll end up doing it to some extent. You try and minimize the mistakes you make for down the line. And then again, ultimately, if you don't have to go rebuild stuff, you're going to get stuff out faster. Yeah, I definitely found that I made a tremendous amount of mistakes, particularly around planning different sprints where I didn't have someone to bounce ideas off of before I planned the sprint before. So in the middle of the sprint, the developers would come to me and be like, hey, I think you're missing some details from this issue. Like they would find edge cases that I didn't think of or some specific uh, UI implementation or they were missing the workflows of different feature sets and things. So oftentimes the complexity of the sprint would grow during the sprint and then it would screw up the the stories or the epics and then my CTO would get mad at me and my COO would get mad at me. And so... Eventually, they forced me to use ProdPad. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a product management software. It's like about $1,800 a year. And then we decided to hire a product manager a few weeks ago. Now we're doing like product meetings every week. Or if I am preparing something, I can share it with her before it gets slotted in so that she can help me find problems. And so I, I agree having a team is forcing me to step my game up because I don't want them to find mistakes. I don't want them to come back to me and then I have to spend more time on this because I forgot about something. And so it's forcing me to get better at design, to get faster at design, to be more thorough with the different workflows I create, to create more standard in my design. And you know what? Having a design system has been extremely helpful in setting a foundation for me in how to do all of that stuff. We're in the position where where we have teams, you know, and we're, we're down the line. This is awesome to have this. You know, when you first start, don't necessarily have those. Don't go build all the processes in day one. Don't make a product manager your first your first hire. Muddle through. It's like you don't make your sales guy necessarily the first hire. Yeah? Like so, like work out when you can do this and increase the process over time. The other is like you are going to make mistakes, and that's actually okay. And that's a key part of building great products is you have to be willing to take risks and to test stuff where you don't know the answer. So what that means ultimately is that mistakes will get made. Things will unpack in ways you'd like, users will behave in a way that no one could have predicted because who knows? Again, that's okay. But, but what you're trying to do is to minimize the time cost it takes to find out those mistakes. And when you find that good mistakes and then you act on them and then dig deeper again, understand and then fix them again, this is the stuff that makes good companies great because you ultimately end up coming with solutions that are incredibly hard to get to. That you've had to get through, through some trial and error. That means that if anyone ever wants to copy or do anything else, they're going to have to go through this process and it's expensive and hard to get to there. I guess what you're trying to do is just minimize that time. If every build takes you a quarter to do and you're going to have to do four builds to find out what it is that really works, that, that, that's, that's a year gone. Instead, if every build takes you a sprint, so kind of two weeks, then two months in, you're in that same position. And you may be invested less time and you try to find the mistakes early. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. Build process as you go. But the whole point here is minimize the time it takes because that's the number one thing you, you can't get more of. You can get more money, you can get more people, like you cannot get more time. 
That's a finite resource. Recently, we started doing feature proposal meetings. So it includes myself, my CTO, my COO, marketing director, and product manager, so that we've got all of the different departments understanding, okay, what's the usability? What's the feasibility? What's the marketability? What's the user friendliness? What's the complexity, et cetera? What I found was when we first had a conversation about a feature that I proposed, they would be like, oh, that sounds great. But then I would go back and I would go, you know what? Actually, I think there's simpler ways to do it. And so I, for one of the feature sets, I went through, I spent a day and I redesigned it multiple times in order to make it as simple as possible. Why don't you speak to how people can think about how to make what they're building as simple as possible in order to save time for development and to make it more user-friendly? A nice framework for this is to think about any product you're building kind of three levels. So you're going to have necessity. What does this feature have to do? Like, what is the problem? With us, if it, again, being a video platform, one issue would be not creating a new video. That's the number one thing we're trying to do. The function has to do that. Whatever you design has to have, have that in there. You then have next stage, which is kind of like, this is the expanded feature set. So you have the kind of crucial part. Next part is, is this would be great if it had this. So yeah, we'll help people create a video and we'll also help them brand that video. The last part is the delight factor that goes on top of this. Now, when you first build features and test features, forget the delight factor because this is like the icing on the cake. When you know it works and it's going to go ahead, come back and do that as well. How do you make creating a new video the most delightful process? And how do you add little things in where people are like, that was enjoyable. You know, it makes them feel good about doing it. So when you ever build any feature, it has to do the thing you're trying to do. That's actually your goal. And if you just do that, that's okay. Because you can work out very quickly if that was right in the first place. So let's say you you mentally go through these three stages. Let's say you mock up all three of these stages. Are you only going to push out the first stage for your test? And if people like it, then you move on to stage two and then to stage three? Or do you leave stage two and three for like a year later? Or like, how, how do you prepare for that? depends on the stage of the product, the stage of the company, and what it is you're trying to do. So if you're trying to do like quite a small feature, you can probably do, do all three of these. You know, if you're trying to fix a small problem and the whole thing, even at the delight scale, it's like a, it's a day's work, get it in here. Like, like you know, if it's an extra 20% time to do, to do the delight, but that 20% is a couple of hours, do it. And that's a good thing. If this is a product you're trying to build, like a new product you're releasing, or your first product, and that delight is an extra 20% of time, but the first thing is going to take you three months, do you want to spend the extra whatever it is, you know, four weeks time building this, or would you be better off utilizing that time to go and build something else, which is also crucial because we don't have just one product in our historicals and we're not building one thing. We have stuff backed up. And so this is part of the role of getting good at product management is being kind of ruthless around this. If you're building one thing in isolation, maybe you're going to do all three, but that's never the case. I mean, if I look at our kind of like upcoming feature list, like it's, it's, it's insanely big. And so you look at it and I'm like, I'm like, I could spend another four weeks on this or I could go and build this other thing, which I think also satisfies number one and two, another core part of the issue as well, which is also very important. So the total value of me doing stages one and two on two features versus doing stage one to three on one is going to be higher for the end user and therefore they'll stay longer and they'll spend more money and, and will grow faster you might just want to do the first stage if it's more known so there's also like risk here as well if you're building something new and you're like wouldn't it be cool if we did this and you talk to some users and they're like yeah we'd use that and you're like i think they'd use it i'm not 100 sure if they would use it maybe just do step one you don't necessarily have to there's the idea of like minimal via products and i heard someone else term it minimal marketable products so kind of like mmp which is like as your company grows you want to get stuff out the door that doesn't look like a dog's dinner you want to actually actually look good as well but this is why you also have things like beta users so you have a core set of users who you can't know and you can use customer success to help you find these and bring them in these are your like early adopters your innovators and you're like look we've got this new idea it looks goddamn awful However, if you want to give it a shot, I'm going to turn on a toggle and you can go and try it out and just give us some feedback. There'll be a subset of users who are like, hell yeah, like I want to do that. And they'll go on board and and do it for you. And therefore you can release stuff that doesn't look great and learn early on. So the most of your user base, if you're, you know, Atlassian or or large company, you're going to release something like at that level, probably not. You probably want to develop it further. If you're a new startup and you're building your first product, yeah, you want to make all your releases like that because you don't have any users anyway. So like you're not really going to upset anyone and you'll find your early adopters and innovators. So look, again, like the, the spectrum really is about the size of the thing you're building. Each step is going to add on, you know, 20 or 30% of time. Where is it worth the benefit versus the time? It depends on the risk stage as well. If it's super unknown, just don't invest too much time into it anyway. Um, it also depends on the stage of your company and where it's at. We're getting ready to start having people try out the product in about 
a month, month and a half. But we feel like we probably won't be able to start charging for the product because there's a competitor, there's enough competitors in the market that we really need to have people just use it and see what they think before we feel comfortable to start charging for it. It's probably 10 months to a year out. Based on watching how people use the product, how can we determine what is something we should charge for and what is something that everyone should be able to use for free? I will challenge your thinking there. Personally, I think you should charge as soon as possible. I've never seen a founder charge too much for product or charge too early. I think like as founders, this is always a surprising lesson to learn. We have only ever put prices up over time. We've obviously increased increase value with it too, but we also got payments on plans very early on. We had a free, we had a free option and a paid to play option. So we didn't take away the fact that we had free and testing, but we actually put a price tag on it and people paid and we were surprised. We were like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And that starts to give you confidence as well. So it's not, it's not necessarily about the revenue. It's about the confidence that you have around the product. So the one thing I would say to the base is unless you're doing a large super scale B2C play, if you're in B2B especially, I think you should have a payment metric quite early on. And you can have a free metric too if you are worried about turning people off. But just put it there with something on it and you just never know. Because it, it's also a data point and a learning point. It is also a positioning piece for, for your company. Back to the question around what you charge for and where you charge. Again, this is a research piece. You need to understand from your users where the value is in the product. So where's the real value? Most B2B products are not premium. Most of them have a free trial and then paid. Um, so you need to work out again, what kind of model makes sense for you. And sometimes premium makes sense because you're going after more scale. Generally, if you're a scale play, that's where you consider premium. If you're not a scale play, free trial is good. You might not get as many science, but going to be more serious anyway, because in there, there's a payment piece at the end of it. Tie your pricing to the real core value in the product. If you're not doing a freemium model, that needs to be value they can't they can't go without. If you're doing a freemium model, tie it to anything that is crucial for scale. So you might have free users that are like little tiny users, little like, you know, single entrepreneurs, and that's fine. But as soon as they start to get a bit of a team and start to build a business, you want to be charging them. And they're going to have revenue at that point to do that. So to give an example, with us, we tie revenue to features. We have features around branding and around customization and around making it easier for teams to work, pieces around scale and ability, and we tie our pricing to that. Some platforms do usage-based pricing. So if you look at any CRM mailing list, it's all about the bigger you get as a company and the more you start to use their product, the more they'll charge you. Those models are wonderful because... As the company is growing, that's a positive thing for them. So if they're starting to pay a bit more over time because they're growing and have more revenue, you actually like align with them as a company. So again, like it works on that scale. There's a million different price models. Look at them all, <laughs> like like dig into all of them. But you need to tie again the price into the value. Side. How much people will pay is a whole other kettle of fish. And how you price, you will change your pricing. We've changed our pricing, I think, nine times so far. I chatted to a company the other day called Biteable, who are a much bigger video platform. They said they have 127 different custom plans from all the pricing tests they've done over the last three years. And they're like, we can't calm it down, but, but they would do a new pricing test every single month without fail. Do a lot of pricing testing when you get capacity to do it. And generally, most of the time, it comes down to putting your prices up over time. But if your product's building value, that, that also makes sense. You said there's a, a feature you have around branding. So would you show the user on the page where they're doing branding or customization or whatever and go, hey, if you upgrade, then you can unlock this branding feature? Or do you hide that and just show them on the pricing page or the comparison page of like, oh, you'll get a branding thing? So how do you entice them? Yeah, never hide stuff. So this comes down to free trials as well. Like, so if you have a proper free trial, you're doing 14 days or 21 days or seven days or whatever it is that you think is going to make sense. You let them use the paid features. You let them taste it. You might want to limit that, but you let them utilize it so that you get hooked on those features. I'll talk to the majority and I'll talk to like B2B plays here. Again, things like Dropbox where it's like mostly free, like, yeah, like free models will leave aside for now, but you let them try those. And then at the end of 14 days, you're like, Guess what? You can't use those anymore. <laughs> so you take them away again. People are like, oh, I want that back again. You might just lock their account and be like, we can't use the product anymore. Walking customers through plans is really important. Yeah. So if, especially, if, so if you do tiered pricing, then the reason we have tiers is because you want customers over time to move on to higher and higher price plans that come with more features 
the first time we launched, we had a single pricing plan and that was it for all users because it was simple. And we were trying to test, do we have a product and a business here? That's a great way to launch products. As you start to build more features and build the platform out, you then start to bring in a second tier and then a third tier and on you go. When you build those other tiers, you're trying to move users up those tiers always. Like, like the ideal scenario is everyone starts on the first plan, they finish on the last plan. So everyone moves up over time. You then tie those upgrades to stuff that people will, will want the more and more they use your product. So, so the more they get across your product and the more they get embedded into it, which if you're doing good, then this will happen. Then they just start to become power users. And then they're like, I want more branding and I want more stuff. And then they go onto that one. Have upgrade triggers on the pieces. So with us, we we say, look, you have three pieces of brand new customization. If you want five, it's next tier. So when they go, to, when they fill up three and go to the fourth one, there's a modal which says, it's time to upgrade. We don't hide it away. Some features that are completely binary, aka locked off for free users and not locked for any paid user, again, we'll have an upgrade model there and we'll probably grade out as well. Product is one way of tackling this. Customer success should be charged with, with this as well. So customer success's job is for retention and for expansion revenue. Like that's where they sit. So they're trying to keep customers longer and they're trying to get people to upgrade through tiers and spend more. And this is how you increase the lifetime value of any customer. There's also campaigns they can run. The way that they're doing engagement with users is to push this. They're also trying to promote features and they're trying to upgrade people through the plan. You can do product walkthrough tools. Like it's, you can highlight a new feature with like a little hotspot and say, you can use this now and they get to go and use it and then, and then there's a paid mechanism on it. But overall, don't hide your features away, have them up. The only caveat is, is you may have some features that are really there for power users. You want to make this obvious because they confuse early users. So for instance, we have one where we give people like custom domains. It's quite complex. It's quite hard. People tend to ask for it off. They've been with us for a long time. We're like, actually, we do have it. It's, it's over here, but we don't put it up at the beginning because as a brand new user, there's already so much to learn. It's, it's going to confuse you. So that's, that's, I think, where you see features hidden is they're not made for new users. They're made for people off. They've been with you six months or, or 12 months. Do you have any sort of data on how long a specific cohort or a specific user is at a certain plan before they upgrade? This is the other Pandora's box that as a good product builder, you're going to need to to get your head around. So we talk about releasing products and doing the LCA. That's useless if you can't test them. And as you get bigger, yes, you'll be talking to users, but you'll want quantitative data alongside qualitative. Yeah. So talk to users always, but watch what users do and do they click on this button? Do they do this and do they not do this? You need to understand your users and your cohorts as much as you possibly can. You will never understand them enough ever because as you grow, you're like, oh my God, there's there's like more holes and stuff we're not tracking. And then you'll fill that in, but then you'll be like, oh no, but then there's a hole here. And so it's like, it's a never ending thing. You're always looking for more data, the bigger you get. Again, if you have five users, you're not looking for percentages because it's not statistically significant. When you have 10,000 users, then you're looking at that. And then we have 100,000 users, it's different again. You always be chasing data. But yes, you want to understand how long people stay in trial. You want to understand how long people stay in a plan before upgrading. You want to understand what types of users upgrade versus other ones, both from a, I guess, a channel perspective. So kind of like what type of user they are in terms of like marketing, but also from a usage behavior. So we do a lot of like product qualified leads. So we'll be like, oh, based on this behavior, this user is likely to do X. We'll also go, oh, based on the industry this user in is in, they're an e-commerce client, they're also likely to do X. And then you try and marry these together. So you want to cut your days different ways. I want to change uh, focus a little bit and talk about building a product team. So if you're a founder, you start off, you're building something like me or you, you're responsible for maybe the product and the project management and the design and the wireframing and the prototyping and the functional specifications and all that. At what point should you think about hiring a product team? Is there a specific order of people or positions that you would be looking to hire for? Kind of what's what would a, a good strategy be for that? So I'll walk you through how we've done it. This does come down to your early founding team as well. So as a product guy, we always had the product position filled in the early days. Now, like being a founder and running products as you grow is not a good idea because one side of the business is going to suffer. You're either going to get not as much time on product or not as much time on like you know, stakeholder management and everything else that comes in. But this is this is the life of startup. Yeah, like you'll always be struggling to fill things in in the early days. If you don't have a product person, you can you, you can get, get by to start with your CTO, so someone who's probably more technical, who ends up sitting across products. And you know, if you're the sales founder, then you're going and doing the sales and the fundraising and everything else. And that's fine. We built engineering first. We had a CTO, we hired a couple of engineers. 
Then we took on design. But again, we had design skills like in myself. We hired someone who had some product management like chops as well. And generally, the earlier team you hire, you're hiring generalists rather than specialists. So we hired a designer who could also do tickets and management. So they did more of that. Now, as we've grown, that person that hits capacity. And so we then hired a second designer and a product manager at the same time. So what we actually had to do was, was to expand that out. And then all the time we're doing this, we're hiring engineers underneath at a constant cadence. The state now where we have engineering roles always open, and then we kind of build up to capacity. So we find a product manager can probably sit across two engineering teams. A designer can probably sit across, it depends a little bit on the size of them, but maybe one, one to two. Depending on the size, you have one designer across two on the side of product manager. If those are bigger teams, you might have two designers, one on each team. Then you start to get stage where you have UI versus UX designers. So you, you start to go away from generalists and get specialists in those. If you don't have a product person on the company, it comes down to your CTO and how good they are naturally at running products. If there's no design in the house, I would advocate for bringing design in earlier. You might even want to do it before you get more engineering capacity to help your CTO. You might want to bring on two engineers and then do design. Product management probably starts to come in when your whole product team starts to get to five plus. Five plus, six plus starts to be a good idea to start to think about this. Product management is one of those roles that has a large range of scope and different people will fill different parts of it. So at the front end, it's a very much a research and scoping based role where you're saying, hey, this is a good idea. We're thinking about maybe doing this. And that PM, if they're towards the front end, they actually might input on vision, strategy, and they might like go out there and start researching with loads of people, loads of customers, loads of potential customers, and start to scope out what is it we actually want to do in the first place. And then they will help get that into build. And then and then their role might stop there. You also get PMs who are the other end of the spectrum, which is like they're like a you know a ninja sprint planner and they're running bigger teams and they're, and they're really like hands-on on like managing sprints and prioritization of tickets and what gets built first and what doesn't get built. You can get people who span that whole piece, but again, as as any generalist, you will then start to find holes in how much they can manage. So depending again, if your CTO is also running sprints, I'm very methodical on that side. You probably would want to get a PM who's more on the visionary and strategy and research side. If you find your CTO is great at that, then you might want to get a PM who's more on the on the process side of things, data measurement afterwards. And you will find hiring PM is incredibly complex because it, it's one of those roles that covers such a wide remit and it will fit different companies in different ways. My CTO is very technical but when it comes to features he doesn't have much input he's like tell me how you want it to act and i'll document it and i'll make sure that the technical team understands that's why i've been the one doing the ui ux and all of that and we 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 do have a designer that we work with outsource but it's a flat rate per month. So if I know I have a month's worth of work up front, then I'll hire them for the month. If not, I'm going to do it myself using the design system that they've created. So I was doing the product management, the project management. So from the conceptualization of the release down to the epics, to the stories, to the sprint management. With my product manager so far, I mean, she, she's new with us. So fair enough, like I'm giving her time to get her head around, you know, what we're doing because it's a massive system. I'm still the one at the moment going, I have an idea. Here's the mockups. Here's the functional specs. Turn it into user stories that could be pushed to Jira. So with her, if her skill is at like the sprint planning, then maybe that's where you really get the usage out of her. If she is someone who is great at data and great at research, you don't always find these yeah, you know, someone has these two skills. So you might want to make a call here. So you need to work out which side of the spectrum she is and where her specific skills are and then and then fill the gaps around that. The other thing you mentioned with your CTO is I understand the type. Some people just want to get and build things. I think, and this depends a little bit on what type of CTO they want to be as well. And, and CTOs can span a range. If they are very managerial, great with the team, that's great. I would still suggest bringing them into the ideation phase and where possible getting in a room, be it virtually or, or kind of in person. So really when you're building out a new feature, I will always have design, product management and engineering in a room. Those are the dream team. And so really your PM, your CTO and your head of design should be able to work together and they should actually have disagreements as well. They're all quite different mindsets. You actually want your CTO to speak up and be like, I see what you guys are doing, but that's not going to work and have some input. And there's a bit that goes beyond just like building better products here is also if they are involved in the process, they're going to be more committed. They're part of that. Even if they don't necessarily want to, like start to bring them in, I think that changes over time because their opinion is like, again, if they're your CTO, you obviously value their opinion. If they come in at the very beginning and say, hey, I hear what you guys are saying, but this is going to be such a hectic build. 
why don't we just do this instead? And because they're a different mindset, you're like, yeah, I didn't, didn't think of that. And <laughs> that's a much better idea. You know, like, so I think if you can bring them into a room together and this can take training, I think ideation doesn't come naturally to a lot of people, but there's processes again you put around this. People like that contribute at the early stages better. And it's a training thing. It's a muscle they need to build, but it can be trained in anyone. And so with us, we don't let any engineer sit by and just blindly build things because even with us looking at things and going through processes like we still have to be aware that we have blinkers in certain areas like i definitely do and so if an engineer gets something and they're like this is a dumb idea tell us because you might spot something that we never thought about or you might have some experience and you tried something like this before and it didn't work so speak up and tell us in the vast majority of roles you want people to contribute to what it is you're doing rather than just doing what you say and getting building the thing I'm trying to institute this like once a week kind of a product call where the whole exec team is there. You know, we'll we'll present something, we'll show the mock-ups and then, you know, everyone will get their turn to give feedback on these these future sets. So if you're already showing the mock-ups, you already biased the conversation. It's like, like, here's my thing. So my suggestion is like, you need to get them in earlier. So like, so we do it here. We didn't use this that well, to be fair. We've worked involved people in earlier, it gets better results. Because again, more time thinking saves us like mistakes down the line. So we'll bring them in. And not necessarily, by the way, this is not necessarily always CTO. Yeah, we'll bring in like other engineers if we think this is better suited to, to their like problem space and where they work. So if we're doing something on like integrations, we'll bring in the guy that, that does that. But before we touch a single bit of design or do any wireframing, we'll bring them in the room and be like, here's the problem whiteboard like this is the flow we're thinking and this is like i think we have a problem here and a problem here and then they'll start jumping and be like we're gonna have an issue here and an issue here so the very fact that he's like that's gonna screw, screw things up would actually make you build your mock-ups potentially in a different way in the very first place so you need to have that early on in the process and if it's not something that that, that they want to do you need to somehow work out how to encourage and train it and get it happening and it's not about like hours in a meeting room because i understand that as well like you don't want to spend all day doing meetings but you want to have them in earlier. And then by the time you come to the, the mock up, if they're like, we discussed this problem, it's, it's, it has a bit like, did you forget that? Then they're, then they're already in. It's not, it's not fresh to them. I guess the reason why I wanted to show them all mock ups was for them to understand some people, they can hear what you're talking about and they get it. And other people need to see your idea. And so I felt like if I did the mock up and I told them about what I wanted to do as I showed them, then they could envision what it would feel like if they were actually using it. But I definitely understand your point of trying to get to the, the solution before making the mock-up. So it's actually about problems escaping. So I actually work in like high fidelity whenever I do design work. People are like, you should never work in a high fidelity. I'm like, I can work in high fidelity faster than most people can work in wireframes because of what I do. But by the time I get to that stage, we've already scoped the problem in quite a lot of detail. So we already know where those bounds are, which makes me then work, work faster at the design level or anywhere else on the team work faster at the design level. And we'll hit other problems at that stage. When we hit other snags and other problems, if we then pull my CTO, because he already understands what it is we're doing at a fundamental problem level, he'll be able to give us an answer a lot quicker as well. And so there's no catch up time for him. So it actually again, makes the whole process a lot faster down the line. It's like, what is the actual problem? And it's a problem with scoping, like the real problem as well, because sometimes you go in for a problem and someone goes, this isn't the real problem. This is the problem. And you're like, oh, oh yeah, let's look into that. So again, like more time rest up front. And this is again, with, with the caveat that we are a large team and we probably have a little bit more resource to do that because... When we first started, we didn't do this. We just ran as fast as possible. And as a result, we like we like we like rebuilt our platform twice, which I wish we hadn't done. I look back in hindsight, I'm like, that was so much wasted time. So again, trying to help people like not hit that. I know that I can show my CTO or I can tell my CTO, hey, I, I want to do this thing. And you'll go, okay, we'll just give me a paragraph. What do you want it to do? But I think for me, I like, as you're saying, high fidelity, I have Figma. I have a ton of screens that are already done by the, the designer in a standard. And so for me, copying and pasting the elements and just changing the dimensions or changing the, that stuff is decently fast. And so what I'll do is I'll say, this is the problem that I have. I need global notifications. And then I'll go, well, what do I need to build in order to make it work? Well, I need an icon somewhere. I need, you know, is this a pop-up? Is this a drop-down? What kind of notifications do I need? How should I be filtering them? So I'll write out a lot of the details. And then as I go to build it, I'll go, oh, crap, I forgot this detail that when I was writing, I missed it. And so I think doing them not simultaneously, but almost in tandem with each other helps me to flesh out things that I would have missed if I hadn't done the mock-ups first. So that when I give a presentation, it's a far more 
conceptualized idea that is harder for the team to find problems with. I think proper idea scoping is extremely valuable. We've seen it. I think it's hard to do. We pull ideas we've had and replace them with better ideas or better problems and therefore better solutions. And we started to do that more as we brought this process in. And as a result, I can tell you like right now, we, we don't release features now that they don't get used, which we definitely did at the beginning. We're like, oh, here's a new feature everyone wanted. And then was like, we wanted it, but we're, but we're not going to use it. That doesn't really happen anymore. It's all about how much time to invest up front to get a better result down the line. It's a really hard balance. The only thing with a good PM, they should teach you this stuff. They should come in and be like, this is a good process. This is what we've been through. Like, this is part of their job as well. Is to, you know, one thing a PM does is they are the glue that ties the team together. They don't generally sit above anyone. So they don't actually have management of any team members under them, but they are the most important influencers. So they should influence design and influence tech and influence like product ownership. This is the kind of person they are. So they're quite a unique individual again, and they should help you build better products. Here. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, my COO and her are working together with ProdPad to create processes. And so what I said was, I don't care what the process is that you create. Just tell me what it is so I don't violate it. Like I'm pretty good at a lot of things, but I'm not efficient sometimes, or I may be willing to break a process because I found something is wrong in the middle of a sprint and I, I need to fix it. By trying to remove myself from process and management, then I'm less likely to screw up the team in the middle of a sprint or in the middle of planning for a feature or release. And so I'm trying to learn how to empower her. She needs some time to get used to things. She had founded her own startup before. So I know that she's capable at a far higher level than just product management. And so I want to get the best out of her because I, I think that she could be an exec with us. And so I want her to be able to shine as much as she can. And this is the job as a founder is, you know, ultimately you should be able to be hit by a bus and the product in the company carries on. <laughs> I mean, like you want to get to a stage as quick as possible where the company does not live and die by you. The same for your CTO and the same for your CMO as well. Yeah. So the C-suite, you're there for strategy and vision. Like and obviously you're great at this, you know, and you are key, key to keep the product and the company. But if something was to go wrong, you empower the team to go and run their process and make their decisions. They don't live and die by you, which is extremely hard to do anyway. But if you get that stage again, it's great. And then you start to build other teams and then off you go. Two months ago, I started going, you know what? I'm done with this thing. Like you're the CTO. This is your responsibility. You go do it. Or, hey, you're the marketing person. He was like, oh, uh, I did some research and I found that our name wasn't very good. Like, you know, okay, we'll go do some research and give me some names. If you handhold, people always expect you to handhold. So you need to hand that over. And ultimately, like as you grow, your team will change. And so if your team are not the people who can run that and you need to handhold, then maybe they're not the right person in that in that seniority of a role. This is why teams change as you build. So what's something I haven't asked you you wished I would ask or what's something that you think people need to know that'll kind of tie this episode into a nice little bow? If you invest more time truly understanding a problem, then you'll come up with a better solution down the line. And it seems like a waste of time at the beginning. I know you want to go faster, but spend some headspace and do some research. Solving problems is the hardest thing you can do in the company. It takes the most brain power. So if you come in in the morning and you get straight into emails and you get straight into stakeholder management, you get straight into hiring and everything else, and then come three o'clock, you're like, oh, great. I've got two hours to spend on thinking about this problem your brain's smashed and you're not going to do a good job. I think one of the hardest things as a, as a founder, especially if you're across products, is actually your best brain should be put towards solving these problems. And it's not, it's not always products. It's the same on marketing and same on other areas. But if you're charged with solving those problems, do it when your brain is at its most alive. Like do it when you have the capacity to go and get great solutions. If your team is always on you and, and the company is always on you and you're working in the business, go rent somewhere on Airbnb for a week or three days turn off email, tell everyone you're out and go and work through the problems at a much higher level. Maybe it's you and your CTO and your and your design like that go and do this. You need to spend time on the solutions and you spend your best brains because it is incredibly hard. And if you can get this bit right and you can get the best solutions there, then assuming you're solving the other problems, then this is how you build a great company in the early days. So how can people follow up with you? Uh, so if you want to reach out to me personally, um, go on to LinkedIn. If you search for Papa Bear, I think there's three of us and I'm the guy in the bear suit. So hit me up. If you want some help or advice, reach out. I'm pretty cheeky. I, I've had mentors for the last 10 years. I'm always looking for new ones. And I'm always hitting people up. So please do feel free to reach out. If you want to play around with the product, go to bonjour.com, try it out and let us know what you think. Great, thank you. So if you liked this episode, definitely reach out to Matt. 
And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you take care of your product, then your product should take care of your company. Thank you. Cheers, Joel.